Hello and welcome to my channel. In this video compilation series, I'm going to be showing how I made a mold of the sculpture I'm holding right now. Um, these sculptures I'm holding are actually castings from the mold. And the mold is right there. It's a flexible rubber mold with um, a hard outer shell, shell that I broke down into three parts. So this series, I, I explain all, all the details about how I made it, the materials I used. And in the comments, you'll see um, links to the materials and timestamps for specific parts of the video. If you like this and it's helpful for you, please subscribe to my channel. And thank you very much. Hey, everybody. Welcome to what is going to be the first of many videos on how I make a silicone mold of this sculpture I just finished here. This is going to be advanced mold making, uh, mainly because the form itself uh, requires a kind of complicated mold for what I want to cast. I want to cast uh, eventually a hollow wax um, copy of this that I will turn into bronze at some point. But I also want to be able to cast uh, the smooth cast 65D liquid plastic stuff I used in previous video. And I'll make that, that hollow as well. Um, and I also want to cast solid castings out of um, that plastic. So there's a lot of different things I want to cast into this when I make a mold of it. And I'm designing the mold in my head with, um, with all those things in mind. So one of the first things that I look for when I um, think about molds is um, undercuts. So uh, hopefully you know what an undercut is. If you, if you don't, um, you can think about putting your hand in a bucket of water uh, as a fist. And if that water was to freeze around your hand, you wouldn't be able to remove your hand, right? But if you just stuck your fingers in and the water froze, you could probably work your fingers out. Um, that's because your fingers by themselves don't create an, what are called undercuts. But when you put a, your fist in the water and you try to pull it out, there's just there's ice overlapping your skin and making it so you just can't pull your fist out. So that's a that's a, a really bad explanation of what an undercut is. So um, sometimes sculptures that you're trying to model or mold won't have any undercuts at all. Sometimes they'll have a lot. Um, sometimes they'll just have one that, that uh, <laughs> really annoys you as a mold maker. I'm also looking for things like um, where the, the negative space between the tail and the rock here and any other negative space that might exist. Uh, this this area right here, where his paws are between, that would be what I consider an undercut because this is going to be the line where I cut the mold to divide it, okay? So this is this line is called the parting line that I'm going to talk about later. Um, but what, the parting line is going to be about right here. So if I were to try to pull the mold off, it would catch on his paw. So that's an undercut. Um, lots of little undercuts in the hair. Uh, down down here, underneath his um, lower jaw would be an undercut because that's a deep area. And then you've got probably some undercuts, um, small ones, and like deep rock parts. So it, it right here, especially. So there's some small undercuts. There's some major ones, and there's also the negative space. And you've I've also got delicate features like uh, the lamb's ear over here so if my if my party line for this thing is going to start down here and go follow the path of my finger and then i'll rotate this come down here and somewhere along the lamb's face and then follow the tail down here and finish so that's going to be, that's where I think I'm going to have my parting line, where the mold's going to separate. Um, I've, I've got to figure out a way to keep that ear intact. All right, so that's one thing. Undercuts and negative spaces. Um, another thing is, besides what you're casting into it, is are, are, can you have just one solid piece of silicone and just have, a, have it cut down the middle? like say in a mold like this where I just have solid piece of silicone and then one line 
Okay. That's an issue. That would be um, ideal because the fewer parts that have to fit together for a mold, the less chance there is of failure when you're casting and when you're making it. Um, I need to decide where I want my to pour my material into. Where's my pour stout going to be? And I think if I want to <laughs> if I want to pour in and have the mold fill up from the bottom up. Okay, if my pour spout is going to be at the highest point up here. And then um, I need a vent somewhere for the air to go as the mold's filling up. So the vent's going to have to be over here, at least one of my vents. I definitely want the mold to be filled from the top. So I've got to think about where exactly the highest point is on the sculpture, how, how tall to make my pour spout. I have to think about... Um, the vent on this side, and I have to think about areas like right here. So imagine this, the mold is filling from the top. I mean, filling from the bottom. I'm pouring from the top, it's filling from the bottom. This, this is gonna be an air pocket right here. And also, this area right here would be an air pocket. Any spot like here, Possibly the tips of his ears. Those would be air pockets. Those would those would create air pockets when I'm casting. There would just be nowhere for the, the air to go as the mold is filling up. So I have to figure out a way to vent those areas. Um, so what I'm going to do with this thing, my plan is to create basically uh, a couple of little clay stilts that this thing can set on top of so that the silicone rubber will have access to underneath the sculpture because I want the silicone rubber to go underneath the sculpture as well, not just around it, but also underneath it, since I'm going to be casting from the top. So I'm going to create a, a moat or a clay wall out of this um, oil-based clay here. And I plan on using um, brush-on platinum silicone rubber for the first print coat. That's going to be the coat that takes all the detail. And um, and then I'm going to orient the sculpture, make some more clay walls, and really control where that parting line is going to be. So it's not such, I'm not like guessing as I cut the silicone away from the sculpture, like I did with um, some other sculptures I did, where I really didn't care too much about the parting line. Here, the parting line really matters because I don't want it to fall on an area that has a lot of detail. Um, so I'm going to create that moat of clay to catch the silicone rubber, I'm going to elevate the sculpture a little bit so the rubber goes underneath it. I have to make the vents and the pore spouts, and I have to figure out a way to vent the high high points of the sculpture so that the air will flow and it will cast well. So that's a lot to consider. Um, and I also... There's probably some other issues that I'll run into as I um, start making the mold, and those are going to be things that I, I don't edit out of the video. I actually want this, I want you to, to go with me on this journey of <laughs> problem solving. So please stay posted. The next video, I'll, I'll have the moat built, I'll have the clay sculpture um, elevated, and I'll have the vents in, attached and the pour spout attached. And I'll talk about um, mixing up Rebound 25, which is a brush-on silicone rubber. And um, we'll take it from there, okay? Thanks for your views. Okay, I think I've got the sculpture prepared for silicone rubber brush-on application. I'm going to um, explain a couple of things that I've done here. So I've got the sculpture elevated on little balls of the oil-based clay, and I'm going to attach these balls to the sculpture more securely with uh, aluminum armature wire. So the aluminum armature wire, you can see a little bit of it right there, a little bit of metal. 
but this piece right here is aluminum armature wire covered with oil-based clay. Uh, this long vent from the, the lamb's head straight up, that's armature wire that actually goes all the way through down into the lion's body. So it's pretty it's pretty in there. Um, and that's just to give it stability because the the sculpture not only has to support itself, but when I start brushing on the rubber, that's added weight, right? So the all the little pore spouts and vents that I add have to be able to support um, themselves plus the, the added weight of the rubber. So there's that vent. Um, and then my main pore spout is right here. So I'll be pouring in the casting material down into this. Um, it will fill up from the bottom going all the way up. And hopefully the air will vent out of here. And then the tips of the ears right here, little bits of hair. Those are also high points that I really want to make sure um, cast well. So I add a little bit, little bit of vents um, right there. Now I've also added a tiny little uh, ball or sphere right here. That's going to be removed later. Um, but I, added, I did it to ensure that the top of his his paw would cast. And that's also why I added the um, little vent right here so that the top of the rock would fill out well. And one more modification I've made. Right here, between his two front paws, I have added a, a big sphere of clay. And that's going to be removed later. But it's just to ensure that um, when I separate the mold, because I'll have a party line kind of going like that. When I separate the mold, um, this will make it easier to do that. So, I'll set the main sculpture aside and talk about the base that I prepared here. All right, so the base by itself is just like a really, really cheap plywood. And um, what I've done is I, I laid the completed sculpture on top of it. I traced the outline of where the, um, the base of the sculpture was. And then I built up like a swimming pool, like wall of clay um, in two parts. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and secure the sculpture down. And... Uh, Get it all ready to go. So these are the little um, little bits of armature wire I've got. I'm just gonna put them there. And push them in place here. So this probably isn't necessary, really, but I do it because I um, I just want the added structural support. I'm a little paranoid. So three down. I first tried to do this with just three and realized uh, the sculpture was a little unstable. Unstable, so I've... I went ahead and used all four, which is fine. All right, that there. So I'm gonna carefully place the sculpture inside the enclosed pool-like space I've got. And when I do this, I wanna make sure that it's really on the on the plywood well. And I'm just looking around to see that it's got enough space between the sculpture and the, and the clay walls. I want as close as I can an equal spacing. So this is a, this helps ensure that the, the rubber that surrounds the sculpture will be even, roughly the same thickness around the base. Okay. So I'm going to readjust the camera here, just to point out some things. All right, I hope that stays. So, I have this little sectioned off, this little uh, bit sectioned off here, because um, I realized that as I was brushing rubber onto this thing, 
the rubber is going to drip. If you've ever used brush on rubber, then you'll know what I'm talking about. The rubber is just going to drip off the sculpture. Um, a lot of it will, will pull up, will create like a, <laughs> it's just going to fill with rubber. And I'm going to go back into that pool and just reapply it and reapply it until it thickens up enough where I don't have to do that anymore. But I want most of the rubber, if not all of it, to pull up around the main part of the sculpture here. Okay, I don't want really any rubber. I want to get all the rubber I can out of this area because it's not going to be part of the finished mold. But it is going to collect rubber because the paw is overhanging it. All right. So I've, I've made that to make it easier to collect and remove and add it to the, this part of the mold over here or this part of the sculpture where I want the rubber to be mostly. Um, I've elevated the sculpture because I want the rubber to go underneath it. Because again, I'm, I'm creating an encapsulated you know, I'm encapsulating the entire sculpture, um, all sides, and I'm going to fill it from the top where I showed you earlier. So that's the plan. Um, I think I've covered the reasons. So at, at this point, my next step is just going to be to um, talk about the brush on silicone rubber that I'll be using. It's a, it's called Rebound, um, Rebound 25. And that's from Smooth On. So I'll be talking about the materials used for that, the mixing process, the application process, and, and video and all that. And um, so that's the next step. All right. So hang in there with me. So in this video, I'll be talking about the materials I use. I'm going to be using to brush on the silicone rubber onto the prepared sculpture. So the first thing. Excuse me. The first thing is I'll be using Rebound 25, which is a platinum um, silicone rubber. And this is the trial size you can buy. I'll be um, I'll be using nitrile gloves to keep my, my hands relatively clean. Um, a metal rod for stirring, and that's easy to clean. Um, various uh, cups. I might either use these for mixing or I might just use the, the quart. Um, size, but whatever whatever you're going to use to mix the rubber and make sure that um, it's transparent so you can see the the amount of material you're pouring into it, and um, make sure that you have at least three of each. So, okay, so that's for the rubber. I also have some um, brushes to actually apply the rubber to the sculpture and to brush it and pick it up and brush it because the, the rubber is going to be dripping off into the um, area I've designated for it. Um, you're also going to want some compressed air. So this stuff really helps um, push the rubber into deep recesses that the sculpture might have. Um, and it's really, really uh, useful. So I highly recommend some compressed air if you're using brush on rubber. Also some paper towels. Okay, just a big roll. Um, it's going to get messy. I've, I've prepared my, my work area again with um, black trash bags I've cut. So uh, I think that's about all the material I'll be using just for the initial application. I'm going to do, um, the next video will be sped up of me actually mixing the rubber and applying it. But uh, Rebound 25 is mixed up just like the Molstar is. So it's um, one to one by volume, part A and part B. So as long as it looks like it's the same amount, uh, it should mix just fine. And I'm going to do the, the double mixing um, like I did with the Molstar in the intermediate video. Um, to ensure that the, the rubber cures properly. Um, so yeah, the next video will, will be me um, layering the brush on rubber. Um, at least, I'll, tr I'll try for uh, a couple of layers, maybe maybe three layers. I've got more of this stuff. The trial size is not enough for this sculpture, I doubt. But I'm going to, uh, the first coat, the print coat, will be the one I use the compressed air on. And then the following coats, I won't need the compressed air. But that first very first coat takes all the detail of the sculpture. So that's the most, arguably the most important um, layer of rubber. And after I've applied um, enough of the re rebound brush on rubber, I will switch to another platinum uh, silicone rubber. I'll actually try to combine the, the rebound with the Mold Star, which is a pour on rubber. That's the same green type of rubber I used in the intermediate video. And I'll be using the pour on to to create um, a wall for the silicone. So both sides of the silicone can lock together. And I'll be um, explaining that in future videos, okay? So that's where we're going. The next video will be pretty fast paced. Thanks a lot. 
Okay, I am mixing up, pre-mixing the Rebound 25 here. I've sped this video up uh, 12 times um, the normal speed, so it's <laughs> it's moving pretty fast here. So I, I pre-mix um, both part A and part B, and then I pour out a certain amount and um, make sure, I just use my uh, eye level to make sure that the they're the same volume. And then I uh, grab my larger container and uh, get out as much as I can using that metal stir rod. I stir the, scrape the sides and try to scrape the bottom of the, the cup as well. And then I just mix by scraping the sides, scraping the bottom, and then I pour it into a second mixing container just to get that thoroughly mixed up in there to ensure that the um, rubber will cure. And then I just pretty much dump the whole thing on the sculpture and using the chip brush to move, move it around a little bit and make sure the sculpture is completely coated. And you can see that the, um, the rubber is dripping into that little reservoir I've created with the, the clay walls. And then I use my um, can of compressed air to just push that rubber into all the little crevices of the sculpture. It really does a good job of helping to ensure that all those deep undercuts, all the little tiny holes and, and divots in the sculpture are filled with rubber. And I, um, as the, the rubber will pull, pull and collect at the bottom of the reservoir, I'll just use the brush to grab more of it and, and keep, up, keep reapplying and reapplying the rubber to the sculpture. So this is one way to do this, right? Uh, the other way would be to mix up smaller batches of rubber and just apply them um, on a smaller scale. But this is the most important um, layer of rubber. It's called the print coat, so I take my time with it. I think that, I think in real time this was about uh, 20 minutes. The, um, the pot life of Rebound 25, that's how long you have to work with it before it thickens up beyond being useful, is about 20 minutes. Um, and at some point I had to open up a second uh, can of air. I was actually surprised. I had to, I'm on my second one here. The first one's not completely dead, but after you're spraying it so much, the can gets super cold and loses some of its juice. So I just switched to a second can. You can see how, th how thick the rubber is getting. All right, one thing I forgot to mention um, is that you're going to need an X-Acto blade or a very, very sharp cutting utensil. Because um, after the rubber's cured, this is about six hours later, uh, there's little stalactites of rubber, that little drips that have solidified, and I don't want those to be part of the second coat of rubber I'm going to put on. So I use my little exacto blade to um, very carefully pull those a little bit and then cut them. And uh, yeah, if you've ever seen a cave with all this little like drips of stone, the stalactites, that's what these things remind me of. At this point, the sculpture kind of looks like a big weird candle with a pour spout and vent. <laughs> so that's um, that's it for the stalactite cutting. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show is the the easy cleanup. So I didn't really bother to clean out the mixing containers. I just let the mixed rubber solidify into them because it comes out so easily. It's it's kind of like the uh, the cleanup I showed you in my previous video. And it's weirdly satisfying to do this. So I believe this was the first container I mixed in, so there's some some parts that are still un uncured came off in my glove. It's still a good idea to wear gloves while you're cleaning up because there's going to be some little spots of rubber that, that didn't get mixed well and 
you don't want that stuff on your hands. And then um, just use a paper towel and clean out the, res the residue. And that one's just as good as new, just about. And the second one, um, I was actually curious if I could reuse the brush, but um, <laughs> no, can't really reuse the brush. It's unfortunate. So um, I just chuck it. But uh, the second mixing container, all that rubber has fully cured. So there's there's no um, liquid liquid parts in there to get off. There's just just parts to pull off with your gloves. Again, really satisfying. The easiest cleanup ever. And after I get these uh, mixing containers clean, I go ahead and apply the second coat. I mix up quite a bit more for the second coat. Maybe too much, but um, it's fine. So I've skipped ahead and just shown the, um, the mixture already mixed and ready to pour. And there we go. You can just see how much rubber I mixed up. It's, it's quite a bit. I've got a brand new brush. And it, I, again, I've sped the video up um, 12 times, so. You can see just how much rubber has collected in the reservoir. It's filled that, that pool area up um, nicely. That's what I wanted it to do. And as the rubber collects there, I just, again, I use that as my reservoir and load the brush, move the rubber around, and keep reapplying and reapplying. Um, and I do every layer pretty much the same way. Now for the third and the third layer I'm going to mix up, I'm going to let the rubber um, sit for about 15 minutes before I actually apply it. And that way the rubber will be thicker and it won't be so drippy. Because there's, um, you'll see later, but there's still some some spots that need, uh, you know, the rubber to be thicker before I can um, move to the next phase. And believe it or not, I still uh, I use the air gun every now and then in the second um, video, the second application, because even though um, this isn't the first coat of rubber. There's still deep recesses that need to be um, filled, and that air gun helps with that. In the next video, I'll be talking about the, um, the plan for the next phase, which is going to involve removing the clay um, walls and drawing in a parting line and deciding on how... Uh, where where the sculpture needs more rubber. So thanks for watching so far. So good. So here I am removing the clay walls that uh, helps create the reservoir and give me that big hunk of rubber base for the mold. And it's pretty easy. As I'm removing removing the clay, um, I'm just cleaning it up a little bit and I'll reuse it later for other ventures. I use my um, X-Acto knife to remove the excess I don't want. And I might save some of that rubber to be used later. And I'm just cleaning up the mold a little bit. I'm also assessing um, where the neck what the next step is going to be, which is going to be to add more rubber where there there needs to be rubber. And I'll be talking more about that later. So I've removed the clay walls and uh, you can see just how much rubber I, I, I got as a base for this thing. It's on purpose, even though it might seem a little wasteful. Um, I could have made the mold with less rubber. I could have made the base thinner, but um, one of the cool parts about the mold I'm going to be making is that it's really going to be one piece that 
divides along the part the party line, which I'm going to um, draw on it today. And it's going to be connected by the base, right? So the base had to be thick enough to um, kind of hold the mold and give it a good uh, solid support. Okay, so this uh, video is about drawing a parting line, figuring out where to put the parting line. I kind of already had an idea. I'm going to be drawing on the cured rubber with just a black Sharpie. I know, um, I'm trying to give you a, a view of what, from what I, my perspective down here. So anytime you're, you're figuring out where to put a party line on your mold, you basically want to figure out the path of least resistance. Like where is it going to be the easiest to separate the mold? And wherever that line is, that's where your party line goes, okay? And some things are easier to figure out than others. This is uh, not too terribly complicated, but I am gonna I'm gonna have to do something I didn't want to do. I didn't want to have the party line fall on either the lion's face or the the lamb's face, but I think it's gonna have to fall on the lamb's face a little bit. So um, Even though Sharpie is supposed to be permanent, it doesn't really stick very well in the silicone rubber. So I'm just following the, um, I was following the spine of the lion and now the middle of the tail right down to about right here. And then like so. So that will be and going all the way up to the poor spout or the vent I guess all right so there's that line kind of hard to see I apologize for the hand holding of the camera but I didn't figure out a way to show it any other way. So the parting line is going to be going this way, all the way up, over here. Gonna curve and come up along the vent and main pore spout right here, and then down. Okay. Right down there, and right across that that little that sphere I put between his paws, that won't actually be part of the final sculpture, but it will it will cast. It'll just be removed when I clean up the sculpture castings. Okay, so um, from this, you can see all these little deep um, pits. So they have to be filled with rubber. They cannot stay like that. Especially when I put on, um, when I build up the mother mold or the hard outer shell of this mold. And you can see underneath, maybe, if I scoot this, scoot this up a little bit. You can just see how much coverage did not, how much did not get covered with rubber. So I've got to fill that in with rubber. Um, one of the cool things about this rubber and the wood combination is that uh, it creates like, a really good suction so like this i didn't adhere the sculpture to the baseboard it's just resting on clay balls that you saw and then the the rubber got poured on and just kind of like bonded to the wood now it's not permanent but 
it's good enough where I don't have to worry about the sculpture falling off. So using that plus some supports I'll, I'll put underneath the sculpture, I can put rubber where it's not. I can add rubber where there needs to be rubber. Okay. But going back to the parting line, it's almost, I'm just going to show you where it's going to fall down here. It's going to fall along that line that I'm drawing. And it's going to curve out a little bit out to here. Okay. There we go. That's going to be the party line. At this point in the sculpture, I have put on about three layers. And um, ideally, you want this the rubber to be about three, eighths, three eighths of an inch thick uh, in general. And it'll be thicker in some places and, and thinner in others. But um, three eighths thick is a good um, goal to shoot for when you're thinking about how thick to make the rubber. Uh, I am carefully placing this, the sculpture on its side, on one side, so that I can expose um, the other side to gravity and just, you know, use gravity to my advantage here when I pour. Um, you might be able to see that I've added some um, oil-based clay in some parts of the sculpture, and that's just to, to plug up some areas so that as I'm pouring the, um, the rebound rubber on, it won't go through and, and, and leak. So that, that oil-based clay that you're seeing uh, on the pour spout there, or the vent, that's that's just plugging up a hole. The silicone rubber will um, contact it and not penetrate it, and then I'll be able to re remove the oil-based clay when I pour the rubber on the other side. Um, at this point, um, I'm using the, uh, the air gun and uh, just... Uh, Letting the rubber thicken up by itself without ac actually adding any thickener to it. I do add thickener later on to other layers, but at this point, I'm just I'm just letting the rubber um, thicken up naturally. Um, at about the 16 or 17 minute mark after you mix, it'll get like this thick, and you'll be able to apply it with a wooden spatula or uh, even with your 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 gloved fingers. So this just, I'm, I'm really just doing this to allow the gravity, like I said, to let the rubber seep into the, um, the little spots. And then I put it on the other side and repeat the process. So I do this to every exposed side of the sculpture, um, the front, the back, um, and the two sides. And I really, um, I'm trying to get the rubber into the undercuts and all the little um, caveats and recesses that were hard to get to when the sculpture was upright. I think with this layer, I actually did use the um, thickener, which I'll explain a little bit later in this video. At this point, I have added uh, many layers of rubber that I thickened up with this stuff. So what I'm going to do in, in this video is show you how I thickened up the rubber with this stuff. And um, you can just see it's really caked on there. Uh, so a lot of the undercuts have been filled in with rubber to make putting the um, mother mold, the plaster mother mold I'm going to make, uh, make that be able to come off really easily and um, I've redrawn the parting line along this along the um, sculpture and I've actually changed um, I've changed my mind about what this mold how this mold is going to be made so I was going to have the bottom continuous and not have a seam in it but um, I purchased a mold key knife and uh, that has changed my mind I'm going to actually make this a two-part flexible rubber mold so that means I'm going to cut, um, use that knife to cut a seam along the bottom. And also, uh, once I add clay, I mean, sorry, once I add rubber for the parting line, I'm going to use the knife to cut a, to cut a seam 
um, in that as well. So this mold key knife is super useful. And I'll be uh, showing how to use that when I uh, when I do it. But for this video, yeah, I'm going to show you how I thicken up the rubber. I'm just I'm just going to make a small batch because I I want you to notice that there's a couple of spots that are still problematic, right, right there, it's too deep, and then right up there. So I'll be putting uh, mixing up the rubber, thickening it with the the Fivex or Fivex and showing how to apply that in this video. So this is Thyvex, or Thyvex. <laughs> it's, um, it's made by Smooth on the same people that made the Rebound 25 that I'm using for this mold so far. And this is a thickener for tin and platinum cure silicones. So I've poured out small amounts of part A and part B, equal amounts, right? According to the manufacturer's uh, instructions, you're supposed to mix a small percentage of this stuff. It only takes a few drops into part A, mix it together, and then mix part A with part B. All right, so that's what I'm going to do here. And um, I've had this bottle for years. It's actually lasted a very long time, and it's getting towards the end of it, but... One bottle should last you uh, a number of years. So I'm mixing that in with part A really well. And then I'm going to pour this and mix it in with my part B. Now, this is thicker than it normally would be, but if I want to make it even thicker, which I do, I'll add a few more drops of the thickener agent. I think um, since it's so old, maybe it's not as potent as it used to be, so I've got to add more than I normally would. That's almost uh, like it's almost like a thick honey consistency. I would like it thicker than that, honestly. What I what I needed to do. Sometimes it takes a little while to work it in. Still too thick. Or still too thin. So. A little bit more. So 
So you should be able to apply this with like a a spatula or a, a, a flat wooden uh, stir stick like I'm using. Or even like your gloved hand, you should be able to apply and smooth it out a little bit. So that's better. That's kind of what I'm talking about. How thick it is. Okay, so I have added the uh, thickened rubber on all the parts I think it's necessary. And now the, I'm just going to wait for the rubber to cure, and then I will create clay walls that will allow me to um, build up a, enough material and rubber so that I can use the mold key knife to cut a seam. And I'll be talking about that in the next video and, and um, showing you the the clay walls attached. I'm going to be um, adding the silicone rubber seam in sections. So that's what's in store for the future. The final step will be um, creating the mother mold. And then also when I detach the mold from the, the wooden base, I'm going to remove those clay balls um, and fill those in with rubber as well so that the bottom is uh, solid. Okay, there we go. Okay, I just finished adding oil-based clay to um, the mold here to create what you're seeing. Um, this is eventually going to be replaced with uh, rubber, right? But I've molded um, the parting line area for this section. And I've, I've molded it pretty big. I've, I've sculpted it pretty big so that it will allow me to... Um, Cut, use this uh, mold key knife to cut a seam once this is all rubber. And I'll do that for uh, this section as well. This section here and also this section over here. Um, but I'm going to detail this part right here first and then just um, we'll skip to the, the end where I've done the other two sections already. But the idea is that you... you um, you sculpt the form for how you want the rubber to be, and then I'm, what I'm going to do is use plaster gauze uh, and layer of plaster gauze over top of this. Let that harden, and then remove the plaster gauze, take off the clay, put the plaster gauze back on, and then pour in um, the silicone rubber. So the silicone rubber will be poured from here, and travel all the way down, and then start filling up this area all the way to the top. And the silicone rubber will bond with the uh, other rubber that I've got. So I'm going to be using two types. I'm going to use Rebound 25, which is this stuff here. But I'm also going to be using the, um, the Mold Star that I used in the intermediate mold making video, the green stuff. And they're both platinum, uh, platinum cured silicone rubbers, so they should fuse uh, just fine. At least that's what I've been told. So that's, uh, that's the plan. The next step will be for me to... Um, use the plaster gauze, and that's what I'll be talking about next. I'm ready to cover the clay with uh, plaster gauze at this point. So just a brief material overview. Um, I've got strips of plaster gauze I've pre-cut. I've got um, a little bit of water in here to dip the gauze in so that I can apply it. And I have i don't want the plaster gauze to stick to the wood base, so I've coated the wood base with um, sawnite wax, uh, but you could use, you know, Vaseline if you wanted to. Anyway, that'll, that'll prevent the plaster from sticking to the wooden base. And the plaster itself should be easily removed um, 
from the uh, clay. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and set the camera up and start layering this on. Just uh, real quick, too, if you've never used plaster gauze before, um, never put anything that has contacted plaster down your sink because <laughs> it'll clog it. So I've got a big bucket of water here that I use to, to rinse my hands. And um, also, don't ever fully enclose any part of your body with plaster gauze because as plaster sets up, it, it uh, produces heat and you can actually get burned doing it that way. So I'm going to set the camera up and get going with this. As I'm ad adding the plaster gauze to the molded silicone wall, I'm keeping in mind I want to have the, um, the, the plaster gauze to, to contain the liquid rubber that I'm going to pour into it. So it's got to be strong. It's got to be um, strong enough to support its own weight plus the weight of the rubber that I'm going to pour into it. And it's got to be able to re be removed from the rubber that's already there pretty easily. So you can see I've, I've spent, um, I've put extra gauze at the bottom to kind of give it some st structural stability. And one more thing to note is that I'm not using gloves, which I could have, would have saved my hands some dryness. But if, if you work with plaster, it tends to dry your hands out if you don't protect your, your hands. So just keep that in mind if you're going to use plaster gauze. It cleans off the, the wood pretty easily, and I use a... Um, a sharp knife to cut a clear boundary. I, I need to trace the outline of the, the gauze shape with a pencil so that I can reposition it exactly where it was before after I remove the, the uh, clay from it. Once this sets up um, and fully cures, I'll be able to pour the rubber. Okay, I've removed all the clay and reattached the plaster mold to where it was. And I used that pencil line I drew as a registration line. So that's how I know it's in the right position. And if I rotate this, you can see that there's a little bit of, I mean, it's pretty tight fitting, but there are some gaps. So what I'm gonna have to do is use um, some more plaster gauze and just like, seal it seal the gaps the bottom and the other side as well Excuse. so i've got to seal those gaps with some more plaster gauze um, and let that let let it all fully cure before i can pour the rubber so right now um even though i i did this yesterday today it's still cold to the touch it's still got a lot of water a lot of moisture in there and that's got to completely dry before I can uh, pour. But I'm going to go ahead and um, fill those gaps in along the bottom with some more plaster gauze and let it all cure. Then I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do the side here, this portion, all up to the top, the same way I did that, this side. And once I um, pour the rubber for both of these sides, I'm going to show um, a different technique for this middle section here. Because you don't actually need a mold key knife to create a seam in silicone. You can actually, um, well, I'm going to show you the way to do it, at least one way. So that's, uh, that's the plan. There it is with uh, gauze on both sides ready for pouring. And there it is poured. In the next video, I'll be talking about uh, how I'm going to make the middle section, which will be a little bit different. 
So in this video, I'll be building the third section of the mold wall, which is the, um, the middle section right there. And I've redrawn where I want the parting line to be with Sharpie. And you'll see in the background, I've got a cheese grater, which I've used to shred the um, oil-based clay I'm using just to make it easier to heat up in my hands. So I'm going to build half of the section with clay and sculpt what I want the rubber to look like, basically. So this process um, of adding clay to the the rubber takes a little while. For one, I've got to heat the clay up, and it's a little strenuous on my hands. It's good exercise. And two, I've got to figure out a way to anchor the clay to the silicone rubber because they don't want to stick to each other, right? Now, if I had used a clay warmer, the clay would stick a little bit easier, and this would have taken me a lot less time. But I ended up anchoring the clay to the pour spout and the vent at the top and just building it out from there. And I sped the video up, I think, quite a bit. But this process took, let's say, roughly 30 to 40 minutes, maybe longer. And um, I was just adding little bits of clay at a time. I'm trying to make the, the wall thickness um, match the, the two sides of the sculpture. Once I get the, enough clay um, put on, I, uh, I'm going to use a different tool. Basically a very thin um, rectangle of steel with a serrated edge, which you'll see here soon. And with that serrated edge, I just rake the clay surface until it gets pretty much equal and level. And then I can... Um, sculpt in finer details that I want. I'm basically building a a surface for the the rubber to be poured into. And so when the rubber cures, it'll it'll conform to the um the surface of the clay, right? So I need to make the since this is the parting line I'm building up here, I want it to be very smooth except for one ridge, which is going to mimic um the multi knife ridge that I'll be cutting into the two sides. This is a way to um, ensure that there is minimal um, spillage or leakage and that the two sides of the silicone um, walls fit together really well. There's the stainless steel rectangle with the serrated edge. And you can see the, the raked texture, it's leaving it on the surface, but it's leveling it out at the same time. And then I can use a, a finer tool, um, which is like a loop tool or um, yeah, like basically like a, a loop tool that I have I've tweaked to have little serrated edges as well. And that's what I'm using there. So that's a finer rake. And then I'll, I'll use a, a tool to make sure that the clay is all the way up against the rubber and there's no, there's no gap. There's the loop tool. With this, I'm going to lightly sketch in where I want the, the silicone joint to be, or the ridge. And I'm being very careful because, like I said, the clay is only really attached to the uh, the mold by by the pore spout and the vent, those exposed bits of of um, the clay. So I have to be very careful not to put too much pressure. Otherwise, um, the <laughs> the clay will just pop right off, and I'll have to reattach it. I'm just digging out a ridge. And at this point, I moved into a, a different tool. So I, there's this metal ball tool that I have. It's got two different sized stainless steel balls at each end. And I have very, very sizes of these tools. They're very useful. But um, I'm going to ensure here that the ridge is only half the di half 
uh, of that metal ball. I don't want it to be deeper than half. If it's deeper than half, then that's going to create a registration issue because it'll be hard to fit the two pieces together. So I'm making sure that it's just half of that circle and that it's even and smooth. This will probably make more sense um, as the video progresses. So just give it some time here. The back I'm going to have to reinforce with plaster gauze to ensure that there's no leaks. So jumping forward in time, there's the plaster gauze backing. That gives the, um, the, the clay some, some more adhesion to the rubber to make sure that it won't move around when I'm pouring. And the last thing I need to do is create a little um, side, basically a top section that's going to act as a wall to make sure the rubber won't spill out. I'll need to flip the mold on its side like here, and there's the, the little topper side attached. So I have a moat right now that I can pour rubber into. It'll come up level with the surface of the other rubber, and um, I've made sure to clean the, the mold off so it's very clean and it's dry. That, mean, that, that way the rubber I'm pouring into, which is Mold Star, that green rubber, will fuse really well with the underlying rubber. And there's the Mold Star being poured. Pretty simple. All right, the mold star has been cured, so I just remove the clay that I've added. The top section first. That's the easiest part to take off, and very carefully remove that plaster backing that I put on. And now you can see the ridge is is now made out of rubber. All right, so I'm just cleaning up with a exacto blade, and I've put um, another clay wall and plaster backing on. And this time, I'm going to have to mix up um, a mixture that will that will make sure that the rubber, when I pour the rubber down, doesn't fuse to the underlying rubber. I don't want it to fuse in the part where it's going to separate, right? So to do that, I use petroleum jelly with uh, paint thinner, or odorless mineral spirits, and I mix them up in a, a ceramic bowl with a, a brush. It's pretty simple. I didn't measure this out, uh, but you basically just want a mixture that's that's liquid enough where it'll be brush brushable, but not thick enough where it's going to leave brush strokes that are visible. You want a very thin layer of this mixture applied to the, the surface of the rubber that you don't want rubber to stick to. There's other release agents that you can use, but this is what I had and it worked just fine. I think smooth on sells their own special release release agent for this but again um, more than one way to do things so and you really want to mix it up well so that you don't see any um, solids of the petroleum jelly and then I very carefully brush it on only in the section where I don't want the rubber that I'm going to pour to stick to. So this is where the rubber is going to separate at the top, right? This is where it's going to part. So I want to make sure that it's that I um, I cover it really well. I let it dry, and where the this rubber is touching the um, the other parts to like the clay and that upper section where I just poured it to. I do want it to stick there. I just don't want it to stick where I brushed on the petroleum jelly mixture. This is Rebound 25, um, which is fine. It's a platinum cure silicone rubber, just like the Mold Star. And at this point, I just remove the um, plaster backing, clean up, a, clean up some loose little straggles of rubber, and I'm going to um, just check to make sure that the rubber did not fuse where I didn't want it to fuse. So it, it's just, it, um, it worked out really well. So at this point, I just 
mixed up a small batch of rebound 25 and I'm going to coat the I'm coating the entire sculpture or mold with this except for the very top where that seam is where I just spent so much time making and I do this to um, kind of level out the surface of the mold so that uh, the mother mold um, has a better more uniform surface to to stick to and um, also it just it's another level of security that the the green mold star and the orange rebound are going to stay together longer because there is the possibility of delamination but this will just help minimize that and the next step is the mother mold so that'll be the next big part before i get to the mother mold i decided i would try out this mold key knife and it took a lot of force to cut through that silicone rubber with this blade yeah, the blade is super sharp but it still took a lot of force um, for the other side, I decided I would mark the silicone uh, the mold key knife with a Sharpie so that I could better control the depth of the cut. I wanted to keep the depth that I, of the cut that I was making uh, uniform as possible. So the second side went a little smoother, but it was still uh, very difficult. And um, I will say that the mold key knife did a really great job of doing a clean cut and one that sealed back up almost invisibly. So that's that's really good. Okay, at this point, I have cut three um, metal tubes, metal rods, hollow metal rods, um, that I'm gonna use as my support for the mother mold and to, and to make, it, um, make it able for me to flip the mold upside down and work on the bottom part of the mold as well. So before I do one half of the mother mold, I'm going to coat the wooden baseboard with sawnite wax because I don't want the plaster to stick to that. I've also built um, clay walls on the other side of the mold. So you can see that the top, at the top of the mold, there's that oil-based clay to create a clay wall on the lower right and the lower left hand part of the mold, I have also, also have little clay walls. These three key points are going to be where I end up bolting two pieces of the mother mold together. And I've also sketched on with a sharpie where my finger is going. I've sketched on where I want the mother mold to be on the silicone rubber. So at this point I just start adding plaster gauze and, and this is a little bit, uh, well, it's the same technique as I used when I built up the, the form for the, the, the mold walls uh, earlier in, the, in this process. But um, it does have one key difference is what you, I have to attach the, the metal rod to the, the plaster gauze. So that's, that's just a little added difficulty, but um, I have to make sure that that rod is attached well enough where it will support the weight of the whole mold plus with what's inside the mold. So I'm really thorough with the amount of plaster gauze I use to do that. Then I smooth it out with my hands best I can. After I'm done applying gauze, what I do is I, um, I take an X-Acto knife right there and I trim um, a clear definite a, a clear line in the bottom of the mother mold a clear boundary and I just clean up the wood a little bit but this uh, this helps me makes the mold look nicer and just helps me know where the boundary of the, the mother mold is so for the other side I just remove the clay walls that I I put up I don't need those anymore except in the corner right over here I have to I have to make sure that the mother mold won't dip below the level of the wood base, so I just put some clay in there to ensure that won't happen. And before I actually add plaster gauze to this, I have to use sawnite wax again to coat the uh, the wooden base and also to coat the exposed bits of plaster where the mother the two halves of the mother mold meet together. I don't want them to stick, so I coat that part of plaster with uh, sawnite wax as well. What I'm doing now is just drawing on the outline of where I want the mother mold, the boundaries of the mother mold. 
so that when I apply I don't have to think about it. So there's the selenite wax I'm applying. And the uh, the plastic gauze on this side took a little bit longer um, because I had to attach two rods. And I want to say here that when I originally planned where I was going to place the metal rods, I was thinking of a, a tripod. So um, I wanted it to be stable so that when I flipped them all upside down, it would stand up straight and level. So I'm, I'm using a level with a piece of wood to make sure that the, um, the ends of the rod, all three tips of the rods are level with each other. And I'm doing a really um, careful, thorough job of attaching both rods. And I'm using a X-Acto blade again to um, cut a clear border or boundary at the bottom of the mother mold. And when these two halves are, are dry enough, I can um, move on to the next step. But uh, All right, so I'm going to bolt the two halves together, like I said, and I've got wing nuts, bolts, and washers here. And what I'm doing is I'm just going to make sure that the, the length of the bolt is adequate. It's got to be long enough to go through both halves of the mother mold and um, allow me to attach wing nuts and washers to it. So I'm just checking those three key points, the top of the mold, the lower left-hand side here, and I'll go over to the right and check that side too. So that is a good length of bolt. So that's the one I'm going to be using. And I've got a little drill bit there I've selected that's just a, about the same size uh, diameter as the bolt. And I just drill three, um, three simple holes very carefully. And after I drill the holes, I can actually remove the mother mold. And I'm removing it. Um, because I need to disconnect the, the mold from the wooden base. It's finally time to do that. And if you remember, um, the rubber kind of bonded to the wood um, adequately. It wasn't permanent, but adequately. Um, and it's very helpful in the whole mold making process that it did that. But now it's ready to be removed and I can reattach both sides of the mother mold and I bolt them back together. As soon as I finish bolting them back together, I'm going to flip the mold upside down and start work with the, the final part of it, which is the bottom. Alright, the mold sits just fine upside down. I'm cleaning it off. And you can see these four little spots. These are the, these are the oil-based clay balls that the original sculpture was rested on that I, I, I installed so that the rubber could flow underneath the sculpture, right? And now I'm having to remove those balls and I'm going to have to um, partially fill these craters that are created with um, platinum cure silicone rubber, right? So that when I do ca do a casting, um, the casting material doesn't leak out of these holes. So I'm going to plug the holes with silicone rubber partially, and then I'm going to um, put the last part of the mother mold on, which is a base of plaster gauze. And while I'm cutting them, cutting these craters out, I'm making sure that I don't have any deep undercuts. And I'm also um, pushing the clay down down farther a little bit. I'm digging it out because when I do a casting, I don't want I want the I want the sculpture to sit level and I don't want it to be um, kind of wobbly because of these four areas. So I'm I'm ensuring that the the clay is pushed beneath the level of the rubber. And I'm just plugging partially plugging 
each spot with some rebound 25 and I'm not plugging them all the way because when I put the sil the um, plaster gauze down for this lit this part of the mother mold I don't I want it to lock in place partially I don't want it to move around on me when I'm um, rotation when I'm doing rotational casting or when I'm doing slush casting I don't want it to move on me I want it to support the base of the sculpture so that's why I'm leaving some of those part of that uh, crater the way it is as soon as that rubber cures I will prep the area for the last part of plaster gauze the last part of the mother mold I'm using sunite wax again to coat the plaster the exposed part of the plaster so I'm just cleaning up the area so that when I lay this plaster gauze down it doesn't nothing uh, gets stuck in it I'm using a wet brush there to push the, the plaster gauze down inside the the, um, the crater to create a really good seal and then I just very carefully um, after what one piece after another I am laying that base of the mother mold down and one of the things I'm keeping in mind is that um, when the molds all done and back together and I'm doing a casting this is gonna be the very bottom of the the mold right and if it's not level or if there's a bump in it it's gonna create it's going to make my whole mold off level. So I'm laying these these plaster pieces down with the idea that I want I want it to be a level surface when it's when the mold is right side up. So in order to help with that process, what I'm going to do is um, use that level and that piece of wood and just check it over and over again in multiple different ways. And I'll add plaster gauze where it needs to be to help ensure that it's level and then I even flip it upside down to uh, check and double check and recheck so the next step will be for me to remove the mother mold and then cut the sculpture out of the rubber and then reassemble everything and do my first casting and that'll be the next uh, video so thanks for watching welcome back to the last video in this series of um, advanced mold making for this particular sculpture here I'm just removing the mother mold finally, um, taking apart those three screws, and I'm going to start to uh, cut the sculpture out with an X-Acto blade by myself, which is something I don't really recommend. I recommend that you get some help, um, somebody holding them, pulling the mold apart as you cut, just like I did in the intermediate mold making video. However, I was impatient here, so. I suffered as a result of it. It took a lot longer than it should have. <clears throat> and what I'm doing as I'm just as I'm cutting, um, I'm pulling the rubber apart and cutting, and then I'm taking out bits of clay at a time and setting that clay aside uh, to help me calculate the correct amount of uh, material for casting the mold solid. And I explained that process um, fully uh, in the intermediate mold making video. Um, each little cut that I do in the rubber helps the the mold to register when I put it together instead of doing one solid long cut. So I think it's better just to do um, little cuts at a time. And after I finally remove all the um, original sculpture clay, the very um, last thing as far as cutting the mold apart will be uh, cutting the bottom. And to do that, I employ uh, the mold key knife again. But I also have to remove little bits of clay that were in the mold um, that wouldn't come off easily, and also cut the vents, cut a hole, cut a line during, so the vents and stuff will come out when I demold from casting. Here I am using the mold key knife, <clears throat> and once again, um, an extra set of hands would have been very helpful here, but uh, it worked out okay when I did it alone. So having two um, halves of the mold easily accessible like this allows me to do like um, slush casting with wax or brush on um, wax casting and, and also with uh, resin and such. Um, I'm here. I'm cut. I'm covering the mother mold, um, all sides and and areas of the mother mold um, pieces with amber colored shellac. And the reason I'm doing this is to um, keep the mold 
together and keep it from dropping little plaster bits as I handle it when I'm casting. And also, um, it's it's a breathable barrier and adds a, a little a barrier of protection for spills, you know, accidental spills while I'm casting. It's also a good idea to coat it with some mold release on the outside and inside so that if you do have a really bad spill, you can just pull the material right off the, the mother mold and it won't be ruined or cause you a lot of anguish later trying to clean it up. So in this will um, finish this video series on mold making um, for this particular mold, like I said. But in the next series, I'm going to start, I will show you how I create um, a faux bronze or a bonded bronze hollow casting using resin, bronze powder um, of this mold. And, and I'll cast other things as well, um, wax, um, plaster, and such, and show you different techniques for that. Okay? So I really appreciate all the views and watching. and um, if you found it helpful, uh, please like and subscribe. Thanks.